all my life, I've looked up to him, I've revered his band, his songs, and his voice. Fergus has a fatal disease called muscular dystrophy. We always said it would never be easy. When Fergus was eight, the specialist said wheelchair by 12 and at 18. This is a huge eagle of a soul trapped in a very limited physical body. Music was something that I had to do. Oh, yeah. When we did a gig, it became like a huge special event. It was magical. Ferg was like our Jeff Buckley. This quest for perfection. With the record companies, it says we're not going to get a return out of this. Fear of his disability and kind of some sense that, you know, he wasn't long for this world. Hello and welcome to the Southern Stars Coronavirus podcast. I'm the news editor, Siobhan Cronin, and this week's interview is with director Michael McCormack, whose documentary on the life of West Cork musician Fergus O'Farrell of the band Interference opens in cinemas at the start of next month. It's called Breaking Out, and Michael spent over 12 years capturing fly-on-the-wall footage with Fergus right up until his untimely death in 2016. Emma Conley caught up with Michael to hear about the project, his friendship with Fergus, and lots more besides. Hi, Michael. Thanks a million for joining me on this week's Southern Star podcast. I have to say I'm very much looking forward to our catch up today. Um, and I guess the reason we're chatting is your documentary Breaking Out into West Cork singer songwriter Fergus O'Farrell is opening in cinemas next week. Um, now, I've been lucky enough to see it already, and you obviously don't need me to tell you that it's, um, it's really, really powerful stuff. You take us from Fergus's um, childhood in Skull, right through his career, the ups and downs with band interference, and then, of course, um, to his death from muscular dystrophy back in 2016 when he was just 48 years old. I mean... I, I didn't know Fergus at all, but I, I feel when, when I saw the documentary, it really gave me this kind of a gift of a glimpse into what was um, a really seemed to be a special life, you know, and an, an incredible talent that inspired so many people. So I know that sounds horribly cliched and I don't mean it to be, but um, I think when people see the documentary, they'll know what I'm talking about. But um, so I guess it was a tw- it was a fifteen year project in total. Um, so I guess why don't we just start? What will you just take us back to where it all started and how it all started? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for taking the time to to watch it. And uh, I'm delighted you liked it. Mm. Uh, yeah. So it goes back a long, long time, even longer than the fifteen years. So it goes back to when I was. Uh, 14, 15 years of age in Dublin, a mad music fan, trying to get sneak into as many gigs as possible. And I ended up working on a charity gig featuring a host of bands from around the country. For a Dublin lad, that was, that was great as well, because a lot of the time I would have been seeing Dublin bands. And the standard was up and down. Like, you never knew what you were going to get. And then this band took to the stage, and they all looked so confident. And they they looked like rock stars. And there was this guy standing at the mic and he had this mad pose. I said, they look so confident. Then he started to sing and I was going, what the hell? And then the songs were so interesting. And so so they were they all told a story and brought you on a journey. And then he left the stage and got into a wheelchair and the 15 year old me went over and talked the face off the poor guy all night because he couldn't get away from me. And uh, I spent the next while going to as many gigs of theirs as I could. And like so many people in Dublin at the time, uh, it became a kind of a religious experience going along to an interference gig. And we all became, you know, their, their people because uh, you just knew that there was something really special happening here. And then it didn't, for whatever reason that I was too young to understand at the time, uh, it wasn't happening for interference. Uh, and they tried to make it happen. And then uh, they broke up. And years later, uh, when they got back together, I was in the audience again. And one this of was, the members. This of was the 80s. Was it the 80s or, or this was the so 90s? 
when they were first uh, playing around the place, it was the uh, late eighties and early nineties yeah. when they would would be playing to packed out gigs uh, around the country, and they were kind of the the band that people talked about in the audience. Were people like Glenn Hansard, Mick Christopher, Mundy. You were looking around you. You knew these were the up and coming musicians. We all wanted to start a band when we saw interference. It was like the Velvet Underground, uh, underground of our time, really. Um, and uh, so when they broke up and got back together in the early 2000s, I was delighted. I was there again. And one of the members of the band came up to me and said, would you ever think of doing a documentary about your man? And I kind of thought, you know, it was around that time when, you know, not just television, but music documentaries weren't, weren't doing that well. And they weren't mm. getting the support and the budgets that they deserved. And I thought it was going to be difficult to make a niche documentary about a band that were loved by so few, so but few. never made it out of, of that group. And then I went down and spent a weekend with Fergus in West Cork. Down in Skull. Just down in Skull. And I left the camera on and I listened to him talk for the weekend. And I said, oh my God, this is so much bigger than I thought. This guy is the best thing I've ever seen on camera. He just jumped off the screen. He was a wonderful t- storyteller. And I just thought, if I can tell, if I can get that person on camera, you know, this is going to be, um, this is going to be very interesting. I didn't think I would be filming for the next 10 years, but I, it, like so many people, once you got sucked into the world of Fergus O'Farrell, you didn't get away and you didn't want to get away. And yeah. uh, the story became almost fairy tale like in the way it started to unfold. So, so it was really uh, like a, 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 pro- a passion project almost then for the next for the next decade or so. You were obviously working on other things, but this was tipping away in yeah. the background all the time. Yeah, and anyone who knows the road down to West Cork, particularly from Dublin, it's not an easy road. No. So I would I, I know the road so well now because I'd be going up and down, const- uh, you know, whenever I could. Uh, you know, holidays, weekends, I would take uh, periods off to for special occasions like going to New York for being in the Czech Republic. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was really important that, uh, you know, the friendship uh, and trust that was grown between myself and Ferg was maintained. And all the while, I was constantly reimagining what the treatment was, what, the, what, what way to tell the story always with the intention of it, of it being finished and that myself and Ferg would be sitting there watching it together. Um, I saw the end of this film. I knew how it was, go- you know, what, what the story was, was trying to say and what the story was trying to say was, even though you were stepping into this world of what could have appeared like a tragedy, that you have this guy suffering from this terrible disease that is, you know, keeping him from doing what he loves most, which is giving his all to music. Every time he would reach a certain plateau, something would get in the way, he'd lose a little something and he wouldn't be able to push it that step further. But you wanted to help him, uh, you wanted to be there to see where he might take it next. Mm, so you never, yeah. you never turned away from it. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned the illness, and that was obviously had to be a big part of the documentary. So, Ferks was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy when he was eight. Um, and there was uh, that's one particular scene that really struck me um, when he said that he didn't always suffer from muscular dystrophy, but that he was suffering from it now. That was when he was speaking, you know, and he said that the condition was about continually losing things. Um, and I suppose in what probably was his typically humorous way he said that you couldn't believe the amount of things that you could lose um but he said you never got used to the losses and he described them as little bereavement so I mean you were obviously there for a lot of the suffering that you know a typical fan or a lot of people wouldn't have been aware of at all so was that pretty humbling yeah yeah but no I mean anyone who knew Ferg will would say this uh you didn't notice it you yeah. didn't notice the disease. You didn't notice the suffering because he was just so much fun. I spent okay. most of my time laughing my ass off with him. He was the funniest man I ever knew. And when you did notice, uh, he would quickly change the subject, or he'd be, you know, he had so much, so much of an interest in other people. He would always find a way of moving off that. He he didn't like to dwell on it. But as you said, 
there came a stage where it's a it's a horrible disease and uh, it, it came, came to a stage where the one thing that uh, mattered most to him was his breath and the way he could turn it into song mm. and when that became a constant struggle he was finding it finding it really hard because he was losing the opportunity to to sing and he saw that on the horizon and that that was killing him yeah. And having to battle for the breath was the hardest thing. But for me, I spent most of my time laughing with him. It was difficult towards the end, but I would say um, that's what made him so remarkable. And I think I always knew that as well, that when people stepped into this world and saw this film, that even though on paper it might seem like he might have a difficult and tragic life, it's not that at all. Okay. And you come through. You come through his story. I hope feeling uplifted. Definitely. Um. Yeah. Totally. That was my feeling yesterday. But I, I have to say, all without sounding a bit again cliched, I think when people will see it, they'll start questioning what their own legacy might be or what their own impact on the world might be because his was so enormous or appeared to be so enormous in my impression anyway. Um, but actually, so you've, you've, you've obviously told us you were a big fan, but you know, this isn't kind of um, a hero worship documentary by any means, I didn't think, you know, you're, you're showing him like, you're showing Fergus like he was. And he admits at one point, you know, like all artists, I guess, to being a bit difficult to work with and, you know, perfectionist, hard to sign off and things. You know, how did you were working together? like? For a long time and how, how did you two get on do you get on well or whether did you come to artistic blows yourselves at any stage artistic <laughs> blows. i'm just thinking about the many people down in west cork are gonna laugh uh, yeah he, i mean ferg was yeah ferg was at one stage i used to laugh at him and i, I used to say i'm going to change the title of this film to the great procrastinator because he could never ever make a decision he, um, <laughs> he, he liked to fleet around with things to the nth degree because it mattered so much but he had difficulty letting things go and that included i suppose when it comes to, the, to this film there were times when he would tell me a story and it'd be a wonderful story and i'd, I'd grab the camera and then he'd go off on a tangent so he he liked to make you work yeah and i suppose he knew that by making you work that you would uh, end up you know working very hard to get to the to the real story and i suppose everyone who worked with him as a musician would say the same thing that even though he drove you bonkers there was always method to his madness and um, even when you see there's a scene in the film with Len Hanser towards the end, uh, which I call the ultimate duet, where, where Glenn is blowing into a, a hose to help Ferg sing. It sounds ridiculous. It sounded like a ridiculous idea, um, but there was method to his madness, and he, he always, he always kind of knew what he was doing. Mm. I mean, actually, I was, I was going to come to that in a second. Um, the, the, his friendship with um, Glenn Hanser also just really jumps off the screen and, um, as being something really special. Um, and as you say, that scene where uh, Ferguson's dad, Vincent, was sent off to get the piece of pipe from a hardware, hardware shop and that Glenn was literally blowing down one end and giving Fergus the breath to to get the the lines out, and when they were when they were filming the second album, is uh, like as you say again, it sounds ridiculous, but it's it's kind of almost mind blowing. And um, what what how did Glenn push it that it was like pushing or helping to push a Rolls Royce along the road or something like that? But he, he put it so he put it so well, and it just kind of captures their friendship. You know, they had something yeah. really special going on, didn't they? They did, but. That, that whole scene is very special. I mean, um, somebody was asking me, was it difficult, difficult to get the people who uh, were in the documentary, was it difficult to get them involved? But actually, there's something incredibly special about, you know, the whole band of brothers that is uh, the music scene in Ireland, and particularly around that time. I mean, an awful lot of young musicians grew out of that time and grew mm. out of being in the audience watching interference and being inspired by them. And nobody ever forgot that. Um, you know, 
all those musicians uh, would have turned around and done anything for Ferg and he could call on anybody and Glenn was one of those people who luckily got to a stage where all the graft he put in had uh, you know had he got some success but he didn't forget where he came from or, and he went back to the well and tried to bring Ferg along for the ride so that he could experience some of it as well mm. because or Glenn, like so many of us, you know, you have your heroes. And I, th I think Glenn said it to me, you know, you kind of love to hold on to those heroes for yourself until you grow mature to enough to realize you've got to let them out. You've got to let everybody else know about them. I mean, for a lot of people who go into this film, they won't know who Fergus so far is. Yeah, that was me completely. Yeah. But, but now... Go on. No, I was, I was going to say, but uh, but that doesn't really seem to matter. You can get past that very quickly. And uh, kind of like I said, you can kind of feel like you know him almost immediately, you know, not too far into the film. Um, so uh, I think I think it's going to open Fergus's world to so many people that, that, that didn't have the privilege or weren't part of that, as you say, band of brothers, um, you know, in, in the music scene. So I think that's really a big gift that you've given, given a lot of people. Um, but as well, I was going to say, you know, you said Fergus wasn't really um, one for feeling sorry for himself. And that pipe blowing scene, I think, could have been, you know, incredibly sad but the two of them actually were just having a good old skit over the whole thing like um which as you say probably typifies his his his, his, his attitude yeah he was and which is yeah, why so many yeah. people like to yeah yeah because when i look back at um he Fer, fergus passed away two weeks later and it took me a while to go looking at the footage but when i did i real it was only when i looked at it i realized that how much he was suffering towards the end and uh and that says everything about him, that at the time you didn't notice it. You knew he was, that all that mattered was that he needed to sing and he needed to get it out there. Um, and he would do anything to try and yeah. do that. And he was also realizing that this film was his legacy and he was creating magic for the screen. And I was just, you know, a, it was a privilege to witness. Mm, yeah, and I guess his uh, marriage to Lee was also something um, pretty special that you managed to capture. I think what did, what did he um, call it? His bottled tsunami or controlled nuclear explosive. Yeah, and then he said more gently that you know she's my happiness. So I mean, you want to be obviously a bit of a rock not to not to feel something at that point. But she was she was the kind of she, she was his match like she wasn't taking any crap off him either that's probably why it worked so well 100 percent. i mean you know i obviously loved ferg uh, i loved lee and i loved uh what they had it was it was inspirational in that you know i was witnessing uh you know a really romantic up uh, you know over the top a love story in mm. front of me, you know, and when they would tell me about how they met, I was kind of, I was almost incredulous. I was kind of going, really? Do you want you to know, this is so beautiful. tell that story? Oh, okay. So, so it's told very well in the film. Thanks. You know, when yeah. they told, when Ferg would tell me certain stories, I would all, all, I would immediately be kind of putting them into compartments in my head going, okay, that's going to be that has to be told. How am I going to tell that? So yeah. this particular story is told through animation, through 2D animation by a, a, a brilliant young animator called Sean Cunningham. And um, uh, it's basically the story of how Ferg and Lee met. And they met in a hospital in Cyprus where over the years when you, when you suffer from a disease like muscular dystrophy, uh, you know, your enemy can be the common cold and mm -hmm. pneumonia could be a killer for somebody with muscular dystrophy. And he caught one of his earliest, I think his first bout of pneumonia and ended up in this hospital in Cyprus. And she was his nurse. And she had two words of English, <laughs> pain and hello. And uh, in a very short amount of time, the scene that is, is shown in the film, uh, she would borrow pens off him because Berg was always doodling and always writing ly lyrics and different things. And she would borrow his pens and because obviously he was getting around the place in a wheelchair at that stage, he, he ended up with no pens and he went off to look for her in the wheelchair and he found her and he said, 
he said, Lee, you know, hey, I've got no pens left. Could you bring pens back to me when you get the chance? Saying it in the nicest way as he possibly can. But she was a massive personality and she was going, well, how dare he? And she stomps back to the room and fires the pens at him. And, you know, there's your pen, take your pen. And as, as it shows in the animation, that was the point where he realized he'd found his match. He found the person that could, you know, that he he fought, completely yeah. fall in love with her personality, mm -hmm. and it was a, it was re very shortly a two way thing that they fell in love in that hospital, and that she ended up moving to Ireland, and she is without doubt one of the stars of the film, you know. Because yeah, definitely. Not, not only, you know, he he comes across as such a massive character in this film, and uh, I always knew that he would you know his personality would jump off the screen lee was a lot quieter and shyer when i first met her but the way she she grew to love telling stories as well is just remarkable and uh you know she's you know she's fantastic yeah she, the two of them together were such a brilliant support to each other yeah, exactly. I think, um, and, and the 10, you know, she obviously was caring for him more um, towards the latter years as well. And that, that all comes across in a really moving way. Um, I was going to ask you a bit like um, Fergus finding it hard to sign off on things. Did you find it hard to sign off um, on, on the film? Um, and I guess more specifically, you had envisaged that he would act, that Fergus would actually see it, didn't you? That was your, that was your kind of vision. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it was, I don't know, was it Lydia or Sharon, one of his sisters said yeah. to me after he passed away that he, he, you know, over the last couple of years, he never had any intention of letting me finish it because I, I took okay. two years out to try and get it finished because I, I was concerned. I was constantly, there was a, an anxiety and a fear there all the time that, that he would pass away and he wouldn't get to see it because mm. I knew how special it was going to be um but he had at some stage decided that he was taking me on the full journey so uh so and uh, and and he did yeah and, uh, that's what, the story. What, 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 but but i suppose your question is that uh did i turn into a procrastinator yeah. then i suppose in a kind of a way i did i mean i was heartbroken like so many people so it became difficult for a while to go through the footage um, yeah. but it became all the more important because um it just because he had allowed me and given me the privilege of being with him uh, all the way to the end and i had to to make the film that i talked to him about i talked mm. to him about how everything was going to be treated he knew about the reconstructions he knew about the animation he knew what I was trying to do and I made a promise to him that that was the way it was going to be told because I knew once I got the the opportunity to um, tell it that way that it would be a bit special. Mm, so you think you think he'd appre uh, approve of it? I don't what, know. What do, you think he, what do you think he'd say? I'd say he'd still be giving out. He'd still be giving out. He, he never wanted to let anything go. He yeah. Always, and, and, and Fergus was a great... Uh, he... Um, he loved his own music, <laughs> I'm so sure. He, and he liked to have control. So giving up control to me would have been difficult for him. But I think he would have loved the fact um, that I stayed true to what I told him. And I think he would have absolutely loved the fact that, that Lee is the, almost the star of the show. Mm, okay, that, that's nice. Well, I mean, uh, that's good to know that you think he'd, he'd have enjoyed it, but you obviously um, you won a, an award at the Galway Film Festival last summer, so you've got some critics approval already. Um, and you're opening in cinemas on November the 6th, isn't it? So that's literally days away now. So, I mean, there's this massive excitement building, building around West Cork. Um, people who, ha who haven't had the, the chance to see this already. So I, I think it's going to go down well with audiences here. Um, so you can rest assured on that front. So I guess I'm curious, what's your next project? And is it going to take us 10 years <laughs> to, see, to see it on the screen? God, no, I hope not. And I <laughs> say that. I can say to anyone out there, don't ever try to make a film like this. I mean, the thing, the problem is sometimes the films that are worth making um, sometimes don't get made because uh, 
on paper they sound just a little bit far-fetched just to want to tell a feature documentary about an Irish musician who suffers from muscular dystrophy who didn't have a huge amount of success and to tell it with reconstructions and animation sounds like you're a bit deluded mm. that you think maybe that somebody will <laughs> but, but you well, really you really got it it was your hard work really that that got it over the line wasn't it in terms of the financing and and all of those little bits that weren't yeah, so well, little, the people, um, yeah there's a there's a couple of um there's a couple of really important people out there and important groups of people you know the uh the, the crowdfunding community, the people who love Ferg, who who helped me keep going at one stage. Mm. There's a private investor who um, couldn't have been done without, and then Screen Ireland came on board. So little by little, uh, people were were realizing that there was a reason why I was, I was keeping going all that all that time. Yeah. That it wasn't just delusion, but the people in the inner sanctum, the same people who knew about this man and his music. Um, knew that there was a wonderful story there and they were just hoping I'd tell it well. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, you don't need me to tell you that you definitely have. And certainly I think from next week, there's going to be hundreds of people that are, that are glad nobody wrote you off as a deluded director or anything. So um, I, I think, yeah. So listen, I'm just curious, are you still up and down the road to Skull? Are you, are you in touch with, with Frank's family and friends still? Or? Ah, one hundred percent. One hundred percent. I mean, uh, you know, I love West Cork, and I love, I love the Farrells, and um, uh, you know, <clears throat> I suppose somebody was asking me about, you know, there's so much anxiety at the moment about, and a low, a low level anxiety about what's what's coming for all of us, and yeah. and what you know, this industry and the music industry, and how difficult it is for everybody, and whether things are going to happen, um, you know. What's important, what I, what I really hope for is that it, that the film does reach its audience, but that uh, it also, it seems appropriate at the moment that Ferg went through so much of his own personal lockdown um, and that the film is fighting another lockdown <laughs> to get out there to its audience. But if it does, I, th I hope we'll give people a lift and make them realise, you know, that don't forget your heroes. You know, there are musicians out there who are suffering at the moment. And when we think about the great moments in their life, and Fergus O'Farrell has created a lot of them for people, it's the great songs. So, you know, let's let's remember uh, all those musicians. And I hope this film kind of reminds people of, of those heroes. Perfectly said, Michael. Absolutely lovely. Um, and Breaking Out is in cinemas from November the 6th. And our advice is to go and see it. Um, Michael, thank you. That was wonderful. And so to this week's newspaper. Our front page features a gorgeous photo by Andy Gibson of a marriage proposal, which he happened to come across while taking photographs on Garthstown Beach last week. There he met Stephen Daly, who was down on one knee proposing to Kelly O'Sullivan. And it was just as well then that she said yes. We also have the story that TD Margaret Murphy O'Mahony is hoping to get a nomination to contest the upcoming Shannon by-election. We also cover the story about Gardaí investigating the fire at the convent chapel in Skibbereen last week because they now believe it was started deliberately. Our lead story this week is about the increase to level 3 restrictions with the rise in COVID-19 cases. Many restaurants and bars are worried about their futures now with several saying the option to seat people outside is growing less palatable as the winter sets in. Inside we have the news that the London Marathon came to West Cork last weekend, with thousands competing around the globe virtually. Our own managing director Sean Mahan was one of the three people who completed the marathon here by running near Towhead, while Joanna Riddell did the marathon on Bear Island and Roisin Mari Kilkelly ran it between Court McSherry and Tim League, so fair play to them. We also have a story on why Ian Bailey wanted his drug driving charge adjourned this week and we hear about an appeal for funds from the Kilmurray Museum. There is Councillor Paul Hayes' suggestion for a rainbow pedestrian crossing between the church and Spillers Lane in Clonakilty and we have many court cases in the paper this week including one which led to a dressing down for a law firm by Judge James McNulty. We also have communion and confirmation photos from Berra and all our usual columnists, business and motoring pages.
We also have a farming supplement this week, which focuses on meeting the challenges that lie ahead for farmers in the shape of Brexit, cap reform, climate action and the ongoing stress of dealing with COVID-19. There's also an article on the West Cork Farming Awards going online and an interview with the latest Agriculture Minister, Charlie McConnell So don't forget, if you can get to the shops, you can subscribe online by going to southernstar.ie and clicking on the e-paper tab at the top of your screen. Or call the office on 028 21200 for a postal copy to be sent out to you. And now for this week's musical treat. We asked one of our podcast presenters, Emma Connolly, to offer her choice for our Southern Star Sessions archive. She has chosen Glengariff's Kean Elliott, who previously performed in the Star Studio following the release of his debut EP, Hourglass. Kean has been playing guitar for over 10 years and has been writing music full-time for the past four. The song he performed for the Southern Star was entitled Take It Away. Emma said that given the week that's in it, and for our long-suffering restaurants and coffee shops, she thought it was pretty apt. For more on Kean and his music, see his website, breakingtunes.com. So take it away, Kean. I got away with taking a potion to rearrange all our emotions. There were only smiles all around. Like everybody loves me in this town. But don't underestimate it If you're not gonna learn You're not gonna make it And I don't need my name up in lights Just one right in your head When you fall asleep And I need I got away with taking a potion Six mates above the ocean No trouble, no problems, no girls Seven minutes to change how you see the world But don't think that you could fake it If you're gonna do this Then learn to take it And step into the other side The place where we aren't afraid to hide Just let it take you away Or take it away Take it away, take me away Let me relive every word you say It was worth it all That's my defense I got away with taking a potion Like smooth sailing right off the coast Then discover that it isn't that hard Learn to see the things in life that you miss so far It's gonna grab the beast and wake it It's in your hands now So don't forsake it Just go and learn what makes you smile For me just six mates That would go the extra mile Southern Stars Coronavirus Podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our podcast, which is available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts.